Where were you when, as it were, the world stopped turning on September 11th, 2001? It is a day we'll never forget. When the events of that day transpired, I was sitting in a general introduction to business class at Motlow State Community College in Tullahoma, Tennessee. We were beginning to, our class, we were in class, in the middle of class, when I and the rest of my classmates heard the news of the terrorist attack on our nation and the events that occurred at the Twin Towers when the two Twin Towers, when those planes crashed into those Twin Towers. And those Twin Towers went down, killing hundreds, thousands of innocent lives. This very day marks the 15th anniversary of that terrible and tragic day in which countless innocent lives were lost needlessly at the hands of evil men. Have we forgotten as individuals and as a nation the terrible loss suffered that day? Have we forgotten, borrowing from the words of the, words of the Daryl Worley song, which was a very popular country song, have we forgotten how it felt that day to see our homeland under fire, our people blown away? Have we forgotten when those towers fell? I hope we never do. I hope we never forget what transpired. We should never forget what transpired on that day. But it is sad, it seems, that many have forgotten in our country. This event was one of the darkest days in our country's history, no doubt. Again, December 7th, 1941, serves as another dark day as well when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. But I suggest to you that, that no matter how dark December 7th, 1941 was, and no matter how dark the September 11th, 2001 was, these were not the darkest days in the history of our world. The darkest day in the history of our world took place some 2,000 years ago on a hill called Calvary or Golgotha, the place of a skull, right outside the gates of Jerusalem at which three individuals were violently and viciously put to death. Two for the crimes they had committed, one who was innocent and had done no wrong. Yet he died for the crimes that mankind committed against God Almighty. There are many days in history which should never be forgotten, which sadly have, including this particular day. Why should we never forget this day? Have we forgotten? Many in this world have. Perhaps you and I have even forgotten as Christians. Let us ask ourselves then for the next few minutes, have you and I forgotten, have we forgotten the promise of the cross? The cross was in God's eternal purpose, according to Ephesians 3, verse 11, which is at the heart of it is Christ Jesus in the church. The cross is the consequence of God's divinely ordained purpose, which He had purposed before the foundation of the world. You think about man's greatest problem. And it is a problem we cannot sugarcoat. It is a problem that is very serious. It is a problem that has led millions of souls to a hopeless eternity and is leading millions more as we speak to a hopeless eternity, and that is sin. It is transgression of God's will, and it separates man from God in the payment for it. The wages of it is death. Now I suggest to you that sin does not deserve just any death, but a bloody, a violent death. You see, without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. Notice that principle. If there is to be justice for sin, if there is going to be atonement for sin, there has to be blood. And this is where God's provision comes in. The cross... From eternity. Revelation 13 verse 8. God's chosen sacrifice for sin. His perfect sinless lamb is described in that text as having been slain from the foundation of the world. Further, Hebrews 9 verse 20. God saw this happening since the foundation of the world. This, and again, 
This suffering by this lamb was necessary. It was required if we are to be free from sin. And that's what God's desire for mankind is. God is not willing that any should perish. God would have all men to be saved. And the only way God will save men is through blood. Through a blood sacrifice, but not just any blood. The blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. Those Levitical sacrifices could not fully atone for sin, but they did point the way for that perfect, sinless sacrifice that was to be made by God's chosen Lamb. And indeed, Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 9, 1, verses 19 and 20, that this Lamb was foreordained before the world's creation and was manifest in the fullness of time. That is, when the moment was right, God sent His Lamb to the cross for your sake and for my sake. Because the cross was eternally purposed by God, it was also divinely predicted by God. You look at Isaiah 53, often referred to as the Mount Everest of biblical prophecy, and we have a picture of God's suffering lamb. His lamb smitten. Notice, notice here in Isaiah 53 that Isaiah foresees these events as having already happened some several hundred years before they actually occurred. You look at verse 6, the necessity of the suffering of the Lamb of God. All we like sheep have gone astray because of our turning away from God and turning to sin, turning to our own way. God laid the iniquity on Him, of us all on Him. Our lawlessness was laid upon Him. He was wounded for our transgressions, according to verse 5. He was bruised for our iniquities. He was cut off out of the land of the living for our transgression, for our sin. And by His stripes we are healed because He hath made intercession for the transgressors in order to justify many. This horrible death had to occur in order for atonement for sin to be possible, for our justification to be available. And as Christians today, are we thankful enough that we have been washed, that we have been sanctified, that we have been justified by this precious blood that was shed on Calvary's tree? Or have we taken it for granted? Do we often take the cross for granted? I would suggest so. That is why we must never forget the promise of the cross that God promised it even before the world began. And we see it promised, predicted throughout the, the Old Testament. And we see it fulfilled in the person of the cross. Now who is that chosen Lamb of God? that would suffer and die for the sins of the world? And the answer is, Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. Do you remember what John the baptizer said when he looked upon Jesus there in John's Gospel account? When he saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He takes away sin. This Lamb was truly the eternal and divine Word made flesh. Notice here, He is described in three ways. There are three, special, three points to consider regarding the Lamb. He is the special Lamb. He was of God. He was from God. But not only that, He is the sacrificial Lamb. He came to take away the sin of the world. And again, that is as Isaiah prophesied. God, the Father, laid the iniquity of us all on Him. He bore our sins. He was wounded for our transgressions. But above all, He was the sinless Lamb. He was as a Lamb without spot and blemish. He was perfect. Thus, He was God's chosen sacrifice. We understand He was not just the Lamb who was slain. 
but God who was slain. The only begotten Son of the Father in heaven who was slain, who was killed for you and for me. You look at Luke's gospel account in Luke 23, 32 and through 34, and you will find what happened there. They brought him to Calvary, and there they crucified him. Ungodly, wicked men, Roman soldiers, and the Jews who rejected him, the ones that Christ came unto, and yet they rejected. Now, why did he go to the cross? Why did God send him to the cross? Why did Jesus have to die on that cross? We might ask, why? And the answer is love. He had to die on the cross to satisfy God's holiness and His justice and His righteousness. Remember, without shedding of blood, there is no remission. But it was accomplished because of love. Again, John 3.16, the the golden text of the Bible. How much did God love us? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, I want to quote that to you, and I want to make it personal, and I'm going to put my, I'm going to, I'm going to put, I'm going to replace the world with my name, and you can do it with your name as well. Personally, how much does God love you? How much does He love me? Well, for God so loved Robert Alexander that He gave His only begotten Son that that if I believe on Him, I should not perish but have everlasting life. Fill in the blank with your name. That's how much He loves you. In Romans 5, verse 8 is a parallel passage to that. You think about one of the great songs we often sing in our songbook. I'm getting ahead of myself now. I'll let it Wednesday night. You think about what Jesus gave up. He left the splendor of heaven knowing His destiny was a lonely hill called Golgotha and it was there He laid down His life for me. If that isn't love, the oceans are dry. There's no stars in the sky, and the sparrows can't fly. If that isn't love, then heaven's a myth. There's no feeling like this, if that isn't love. And that's what makes this sacrifice so great is that it speaks to us of Jesus' love. His love for the Father, which led Him to humbly submit to the Father's will by going to the cross. He was obedient unto death. It speaks of God, the Father's love for mankind. And it speaks of Jesus' love for mankind. What was it that held Him to the cross? Was it the nails? And I suggest to you, no. He could have called, as Brother Ricky let us in, He could have called 10,000 angels. But He died alone for you and me. What held Him to the cross? It wasn't the nails. It was L-O-V-E. It is our love for the Father, for Jesus, which leads us to the only proper response to their love, and that is obedience. The question we ask, are we obedient to Him who was obedient to the Father in all things? Think about that for just a moment as we continue. So not only do we have we, must we never forget the promise of the cross, we must never forget the person of the cross, but have we forgotten? If we have forgotten what Christ did, let us never forget, have we forgotten the pain of the cross? You see, the cross is representative of the epitome. The ultimate, it is the ultimate demonstration of man's inhumanity to his fellow man. You you look at our world. 
There is so much mistreatment of, of men toward one another, of our fellow humans one toward another. And it's sad to see, is it not, how we can be so cruel toward one another when we be of one race, the human race. And yet, as I think about the cross, it is representative of man's inhumanity to his fellow man. If you want to see how cruel, how barbaric men can be toward others, look, at, look no further than the cross of Jesus Christ. Look no further than the cross. It is the ultimate instrument of pain. You think about the emotional pain that Jesus suffered knowing what He was about to endure while there in the Garden of Gethsemane. When He prayed unto the Father, when He was crying in anguish, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from Me. Let it pass. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as Thou wilt. When you read those words, you, you, you cannot help but read and feel the emotion that Jesus put into those words, knowing what awaited Him. Because you think about the physical pain. You think about the death of the cross. You think about all the pain we endure in this life. I would suggest to you the pain we endure in this life cannot compare to the pain that Jesus felt when He literally had nails driven through His hands, or literally down here in this part of the wrist, when He had nails driven into His feet as He was crucified on a rough-hewn piece of wood. Think about the barbaric, barbaric nature of those who crucified Him. Think about it as they laid Him and they held His hands down and they took a nail and they took a hammer and they proceeded to drive it through His flesh into that wood. This was after He had been scourged. He had been beaten when he had been ripped open by, by the Roman whip scourgers. And after he had had a crown of thorns plaited upon his head. And these things were not even the main event as it were. The physical pain he endured was for your sake and my sake. Remember, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, 3, he died for our sins. Again, get personal. He died for my sin. The cross, though, is the ultimate symbol of triumph. It is by the cross that we can triumph over sin. It is by the events of the cross that we can enjoy salvation from sin. From, from Christ's agony, we can experience true lasting happiness and peace as a result of His work on that cruel, cruel tree. Have we forgotten that? The world has, and this is the basic message that the world needs to hear. And this is why we preach. Hence, have we forgotten the power of the cross? Think about John 12, 32. Christ said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, referencing His coming crucifixion, will draw all men unto me. The cross has that compelling power. The cross represents to us the good news of salvation because the facts of the gospel begin with Christ's death. If He didn't die, then you couldn't have His burial and ultimately you couldn't have His resurrection. So the, so the heart of the gospel begins with the death of Christ. And certainly in our preaching and teaching, we preach the cross. And that's what Paul did when he wrote to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 1 in verse number 18. 
when he said that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. And so many people today view preaching of the cross as foolish, do they not? Well, I don't, I don't want to hear about an event that occurred some 2,000 years ago when a rather insignificant man was just crucified on that cross. I don't want to hear it, is what a lot of people say. And that is blasphemy. Because it was no insignificant man who, took, who went to the cross. It was an innocent man, a, a, a sinless man, the, the Son of God who went to the cross, Jesus the Christ. And it is through the cross that all men are brought back to God. You see, Paul told the Corinthians, Christ sent me not to baptize, you see. He's not denigrating the importance of baptism, but rather baptism is the result. It is the consequence of the preaching of the gospel. When good and honest hearts respond to the preaching of the gospel, they, they obey the gospel, and being and obeying the gospel, they are baptized into Christ. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. It is through the preaching that Christ crucified is made known to sinful men and the power of that act to bring men out of sin. How to reach the masses, men of every birth, is the question. And we sing this song. For the answer, Jesus gave a key. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Lift him up, lift him up. Still he speaks from eternity. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And the gospel, the message of the cross, is God's drawing power. It compels men to come and enjoy its benefits because it reveals to us the problem of sin, but the love and grace of God in providing the way to escape sin. Have we forgotten that? Have we forgotten the purpose of the cross in that it does demonstrate the seriousness and the consequences of sin? It is not a joke in matter. Sin is deadly serious. It is so deadly that it took the death of the Christ. No other blood could satisfy the justice and the holiness and the righteousness of God. It took the blood of God's own Son as that perfect, sinless Lamb of God. And as a result, it makes possible our reconciliation to God. You know, several times, you know, and you have these verses on your outline, it is through the cross that men are reconciled unto God in the one body, which is the church. Whereas sin estranges man and alienates man from God, separates man from God, it is by the cross, by the blood of the cross, that men are reconciled unto God. And that is why the message that we preach and the service that we render unto God, we have given unto us today the ministry of reconciliation. The power of the gospel is to reconcile sinful man unto God. It is to provide redemption. It is to redeem us from sin. It is in Christ that we have redemption. Now watch this. How is this re redemption possible in Christ? Through His blood. Well, when did He shed His blood? On the cross of Calvary. Through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. It buys us out of sin. And that's what it means to redeem, is to buy back, to bring out of. It makes possible the remission of sins. Whereas the blood of bulls and goats could not, the blood of Christ does make possible our remission. It, when we contact that precious blood, our sins are remitted. They are blotted out. And remembered no more. And that is why we can stand before God justified. Justified never sinned. Because when God forgives us, He forgives and forgets. Those sins are remembered no more. And those past sins will not be brought up again. Are we not thankful for that? And as we walk in the light, as He is in the light, the blood of Christ 
continues to cleanse us from sin. And hence, the cross makes our eternal salvation possible. That's what it's all about, it's eternal life. It is through Christ, through the cross, that we can have eternal life. The way of the cross leads home, as I wrote in our bulletin article this week. By following the cross, by following the path of Jesus, we can have a home in heaven. But it's impossible, separate and apart from the cross of Christ. Have we forgotten this purpose? Have we forgotten the purpose of of the cross? We must never. We must be continually reminded of why the cross, why the events of the cross had to occur, why Christ had to go. But then, have we forgotten the plea of the cross? You see, the cross is pleading with us to this very day. It pleads with all mankind with three R's. It pleads with men to recognize. Number one, to recognize the foolishness and the destructive nature of sin. The cross of Christ emphasizes Christ's own words in Matthew 16, 26, For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? The cross of Christ emphasizes this very fact. It's not going to profit a man anything if he loses his own soul. Because he he does not have to lose his soul. And the cross demonstrates the foolishness of sin and the tragedy of dying in sin when mankind does not have to die in sin. It shows that God has provided a way to escape sin because God has provided those things necessary for man's salvation. Hence, the cross of Christ pleads with all men to recognize God's great love for Him. It is the greatest demonstration of love ever known. John put it this way, herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us. And send His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. And again, that's a parallel passage as well to John 3.16 in Romans 5 verse number 8. That's what the cross of Christ pleads with us to do. It pleads with us, recognize the foolishness of sin. And recognize how much I love you if God spoke to us today audibly. We need to look to the cross. But we also need to remember the cross of Christ pleads with men to remember the great sacrifice that was made for their sakes. We must never forget the price the Father paid. The the Father paid the price of, of His Son. Remember the price the Son paid. He paid with His life. And He did so to make our salvation possible. Christ Himself said that He came to give His life a ransom for many. No greater love than than a man has than, than for a man to lay down his life for his own friends. Christ laid down His life for you and for me. We need to remember and we need to reciprocate that great love God and Christ had for us. And thus the cross of Christ pleads with us to respond. This morning the cross of Christ is pleading with you as we extend this invitation now. We have talked about what Christ did for you. What He went through for you and for me. You need to respond this morning by appropriating that cleansing blood that was shed on the cross so that you can enjoy the blessings made possible by that precious cleansing blood, all spiritual blessings. And you do that by getting into Christ's death. And the blood of Christ washes our way our sins, and it was shed in His death. Romans 6, 3 and 4 explains it. You're baptized into His death, and as a result, you're made to walk in in newness of life. The cross of Christ pleads with you to come. Obey the gospel. 
But as a Christian, if you've turned away, the cross of Christ pleads with you this morning to repent and turn back if you've strayed the way. This morning, may you and I honor the one who died for us by diligently obeying Him. If you're here and you need to respond to the plea of the cross, come right now as together we stand, as we sing.